Okay. So, The Book of Toth, Egyptian Tarot by Alistair Crowley. Uh, this is a deck I don't actually own, so anytime I have to uh, interpret some cards, if I do at all, I'm going to be doing it from my own favorite deck, which is the uh, Marseille deck here. Holding it upside down. Here's the sun card from the Marseille deck. But there's a lot of good information in here, and I think this can relate to the tarot in general. I also have a Rider Waite deck I can pull out if, uh, if need be. Contents in part one, partly linked, mostly proofread. Originally published in an edition limited to 200 numbered and signed copies. 1944, reprinted by Samuel Weiser, Incorporated. 1969, first Weiser paperback edition, blah, 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 blah. Now let's keep going here. The paper used in this publication meets the minimum requirements of the American National Standard for permanence of paper for printed library materials. Good to know. Wheel and Woe, the Great Wheel of Samsara, the Wheel of the Law, uh, Dhamma. Now, there's a lot of uh, typos here, I think, uh, so just excuse me if I mispronounce anything or if I just read typos as if it's, you know, the correct thing. Dhamma, the Wheel of the Tarot the wheel of the heavens, the wheel of life. All these wheels be one, yet all the, all, yet of all these, the wheel of the tarot alone avails thee consciously. Skipping a few of this, this list. Meditate long and broad and deep, O man, upon this wheel, revolving it in thy mind. Be this thy task, to see how each card springs necessarily from each other card, even in due order from the fool unto the ten of coins. So we're going to have to have some knowledge of the tarot here. You might have to uh, already have some notions of what the fool is or what the ten of coins is. Um, if we have any beginners watching, though, I can gladly find these cards for you in order to have some understanding. Well, here's our fool. He's the first of the major arcana, the first. Very differently, you know, I think he mentions these two cards because they're just so different from each other as far as types of cards in the deck. Maybe I passed the Ten of Coins here. Yeah. Ten of Coins. Quite different. It shows no human figures. It shows ten coins, <laughs> literally. Uh, it's part of the minor arcana. Okay. Let me take out my cards and then keep going. Be this thy task to see how each card springs necessarily from each other card, even in due order from the fool unto the ten of coins. He's indicating that the fool would be the first card in the deck and the ten of coins the last. Then, when thou knownst the wheel of destiny complete, mayst thou perceive that will which moved it first. Mayst thou perceive that will which moved it first. There is no first or last. And lo, thou art passed through the abyss. The book of lies. Okay, so we move on to the contents of this book, the book of Toth. Part one, the theory of the tarot. And I'll go into that. The contents of the tarot, the origin of the tarot. The theory of the correspondences of the tarot, the evidence for the initiated tradition of the tarot, Eliphas, Levi, and the tarot, the tarot in the cipher manuscripts, the tarot and the hermetic order of the golden dawn, the nature of the evidence, a summary of the questions hitherto discussed. Now you can see this is going to take quite a while to get through, so I'm going to do this in many, many parts if, uh, if I do finish it.
could be one part, and I might not even get through part one of part one. Because you see part one's divided into three parts. Second of those is the tarot and the tarot and the Holy Kabbalah, Naples arrangement, the tarot and the formula of the Tetragrammaton, the Naples arrangement I know I definitely want to get to. The tarot and the elements, the 22 keys, ATU, or trumps of the tarot. Third of part one, the tarot and the universe, theories of the ancients, the tree of life, the Naples arrangement again, sorry, and the tree of life. The ATU of Tahuti, the Roman numbers of the trumps, the tarot and magic, the Shem Hamforash and the tarot, the tarot and ceremonial magic, the tarot and animism, the cards of the tarot as a living being. So part one is definitely some stuff I love to cover. Part two and part three, we get into the actual cards and part four, of course, of the tarot. But I will list them out because what he's done here in the table of contents is with each of the cards or the ones he's mentioning here. Oh, okay, I see. He sp speaks specifically about the fool and then he talks about the rest of the cards just list listing them. But he gives all these attributions to the fool. These are things you can find in his other book called 777, where you find all the attributions he's kind of come up with throughout his career. I just find it interesting that he's listed them here, for the fool at least, in the table of contents. So the fool, zero the fool. The formula of the tetragrammaton, the green man of the spring festival, the April fool. The holy ghost, the great fool of the Celts, or the Lua. The rich fisherman, Percival, the crocodile, Mako, son of Set, or Sebek, Horpocrat, or uh, Harpocrates, I believe, Zeus, Zeus, Arhenotholeus, excuse me, Dionysus, Zagreus, or Zagreus, Bacchus, Dephuis, Baphomet, and Summary. And then 1 to 21 being trumps of the tarot, or as he calls them, ATU of the tarot, or ATU, I don't know. The juggler, high priestess, empress, emperor, the hierophant, lovers, or the brothers, interesting. The chariot, adjustment, adjustment um, being his replacement for justice. The hermit, fortune, lust. Uh, fortune being the wheel of fortune and lust being traditionally uh, force or la force. The hanged man, death. Art. Art traditionally being temperance. The devil, the tower or war. The star, the moon, the sun. The aeon, traditionally known as judgment. And the universe or the world. Appendix, the fool, one, silence, two, to sapientia et, I cannot pronounce this, uh, what I believe is Latin. That goes on for a minute here. And I think these are just alternate descriptions of those same cards. Now, content continues, goes into part three, the court cards, general remarks about those, general characteristics of the four dignitaries, summarized description of the 16 court cards, knight of wands, queen of wands, prince of wands, princess of wands. So these are the uh, court cards according to Crowley. He uses knight, queen, prince, and princess rather than other decks which use king and queen and knight and page but it's all the same associations. And I think he does this in order to have more clear associations of these court cards to elements of Kabbalah. All right, I'm done reading <laughs> the uh, table of contents. May not even get that far into the book as far as videos go. Then it talks about plates. Plates are the uh, images that he's included in the, in the book. 
And then it begins here with a biographical note. On 18th November, 1898, Aleister Crowley was initiated into the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. He took the motto, Perdurabo, or I shall endure to the end. In February of the year following, he attained the grade of Practicus. Practicus and was accordingly entrusted with the secret attributions of the tarot, especially those of the trumps, or ATU. He worked daily on these MSS, for the most part under the personal instruction of, and I'm not going to read all these things, degrees, etc., titles, of S. Liddell Matters, Ma Matters, Mathers, I think it's Mathers, uh, Alan Bennett, but later Sayada Ananda Metea and Volo Noscare, or George Cecil Jones, as host or guest of one of these adepts. Okay. So st he studied the tarot under these uh, three people. He continued these studies alone during his first voyage around the earth in search of the hidden wisdom. On 8th, 9th, and 10th April 1904, he received the Book of the Law, chosen by the masters to carry out their sub sublime plan. He began to prepare the way for the establishment of the new aeon, as they instructed him. See the, equino see the Equinox of the Gods for a very full and detailed account of this, the most important event in his career. He's talking about himself in the third person. He accordingly published the previously secret attributions of the tarot in the book 777. That's what I mentioned earlier. Uh, then there's a bunch of the Latin that I'm not going to bother reading. Following the tradition of Eliphas Levi, much of his magical writing is modeled on or adorned by references to the tarot. Notable in his connection are, uh, these are a bunch of works. Uh, I can try reading them. The Sword of Song is the alternate title for this one. The Wake World, Liber 30, Aram Vel Saculi, Sub Figura. Mm -hmm. Being the Angels of the 30 Aethers, the 30 Aethers, The Vision and the Voice, 1911. The Book of Lies, 1913. Magic in Theory and Practice, Book 4, Part 4, 1929. He published a full account of the tarot according to the MSS. Again, he's talking about himself in the third person, talking about publications he's written about Kabbalah and uh, tarot. Uh, I can keep going through this, though. MSS of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn in the Equinox, Volume 1, some numbers 7 and 8. <laughs> numbers, okay. 1912. During all this time, the tarot was his daily companion, guide, and object of research. He's kind of just kind of giving his credentials here as into the tarot and telling you how much time he spent with it, uh, his merits in telling you anything about the tarot, I guess. He succeeded in uniting under the schema of the Holy Kabbalah, of which the tarot is the greatest single element. So there he goes and tells you right off the bat. The Kabbalah and the tarot are linked. Just totally. All philosophical and magical systems soever, including that of the Chinese. Wait, sorry, I think I misread it. See, he succeeded in uniting under the schema of the Holy Kabbalah, of which the tarot is the greatest single element, all philosophical and magical systems soever, including that of the Chinese. So he's saying he has syncretized all the philosophical and magical systems under the Kabbalah, and that tarot is, in his words, the greatest single element of this, basically perhaps meaning the greatest representation of this uh, syncretism. But um, that would also uh, be kind of misspeaking because, you know, the uh, Kabbalah is best, best represented by its uh, 
quote unquote tree of life or the, tr the ten sephirot, that would probably be the greatest single element to represent if there was such a syncretism of all philosophical and magical systems whatsoever, including that of the Chinese. I think that tree would probably, that would probably be the better representation. But he's saying the tarot is the greatest single element of this syncretism, this system. This and his Naples arrangement. So the Naples arrangement is another invention of Crowley's, which I find very fascinating. So I want to talk about that as well. We'll get into that. This is going to be long material. This and his Naples arrangement are with little doubt his greatest achievements in scholarship. Then we have a note here. That's all about the uh, secret orders and stuff and the degrees to which Crowley uh, obtained. Biographical note continued. For many years, he had deplored the absence of any authentic text of the tarot. The medieval pacts are hopelessly corrupt, compiled by partisans of existing political systems or otherwise far from representing ancient truth of the book in a coherent system or a shape of lucid beauty. Yeah, I might disagree with him on that point, but then again, I disagree with him all the time. Okay, so basically he's saying the tarot exists, but it's corrupted in some way. Maybe there was some original uncorrupted version, but what we know today is the tarot is corrupted, so therefore he had to uncorrupt it. It had from the beginning of his study been his fervent wish to construct a worthy text. Elifus Levi had himself wished to execute a similar task, but succeeded only in leaving us two of the trumps, the chariot and the devil. Many others have attempted the work, but without even the knowledge of the true attributions. Their attempts have been gross, senseless, pitifully grotesque. But the masters who had watched, guided, and chastised the author of this present volume had in store the reward of his labors. They introduced him, a, they introduced to him a skilled artist, Frida Harris, whose work uh, I don't personally. You know, this was over a hundred years ago now, so I think, if I'm not mistaken, that they made this tarot deck. So, of course, you know, the art might not speak to my personal aesthetics. Frida Harris, who, though she had little or no previous knowledge of the tarot, possessed in her own right the essential spirit of the book. So he's saying she didn't really know anything about tarot, but she just had the, the spirit of it. Uh, together, they bent their energies to the formidable task of preparing the 78 cards of the Book of Toth. His original idea had been to execute a pack after the tradition of the medieval editors, corrected in the light of the descriptions given in the Equinox 1, 7, and uh, 8, but she found technical difficulties, such as introducing uh, 10 raid angelic hands all over the place producing a grotesque effect. Um, hmm. is perhaps what they're referring to is something like this. The uh, rays that come out of the hands of the aces here, like that he's calling grotesque. I think it's pretty significant, and whatever, okay. And she also observed that his teaching in the course of his explanations went far higher, one moment, and deeper than anything in any accessible models. She accordingly forced him, the laziest man in three continents, he's taking a little jab of himself, that's just good with humor, to undertake what is to all intent an original work, including the latest discoveries in modern science, mathematics, philosophy, and anthropology. In a word, to reproduce the whole of his magical mind pictorially on the skeleton of the ancient Kabbalistic tradition. He accepted this colossal burden. It renewed his energy and his enthusiasm. Yet the burden was sore. The anticipated three months work extended to five years. Her success as his interpreter surpasses belief. She had to work from his very rough sketches, often from mere descriptions or from reading between the lines of the old packs. 
<coughs> excuse me, she devoted her genius to the work. With incredible rapidity, she picked up the rhythm and with an inexhaustible patience submitted to the corrections of the fanatical slave driver that she had invoked, often painting the same card as many as eight times until it measured up to his vanadium steel yardstick. Okay, he's a dictator. May the passionate love, and he's, t uh, he's aware of it. May the passionate love under will what she has stored in this treasury of truth and beauty flow forth from the splendor and strength of her work to enlighten the world. I think there's like a little uh, Kabbalistic uh, riddle going on in this uh, text here. May this tarot serve as a chart for the bold seamen of the new aeon to guide them across the great sea of understanding Yes, to the city of the pyramids. The accompanying booklet was dashed off by Alistair Crowley without help from the parents. Hmm. Its perusal may be omitted with advantage. S. H. Soror. Hmm. I. W. E. 8th degree, 3rd degree of the A. A. Uh, maybe that was not written by Crowley. Maybe that was written by somebody else. Soror, does that in indicate that, that a woman wrote that? I'm not sure. Read the comment. Okay. Part one, the theory of the tarot. One, contents of the tarot. The tarot is a pack of 78 cards. There are four suits, as in modern playing cards. <coughs> which are derived from it. But the court cards number four instead of three. That's like the knights, kings, etc. In addition, there are 22 cards called trumps, not like Donald, each of which is a symbolic picture with a title itself. At first sight, one would suppose this arrangement to be arbitrary, but it's not. It is necessitated, as will appear later by the structure of the universe, and in particular of the solar system, as symbolized by the Holy Kabbalah. This will be explained in due course. The origin of the tarot. Hearing noises from my nose. Check here. Okay. The origin of this pack of cards is very obscure, but some, author some authorities seek to put it back as far as the ancient Egyptian mysteries. Others try to bring it forward as late as the 15th or even the 16th century. But the tarot certainly existed in what may be called the classical form as early as the 14th century. For packs of that date are extant, exist, and the form has not varied in any notable respect since that time. In the Middle Ages, these cards were much used for fortune telling, especially by gypsies, uh, which gypsies, I believe, are really the originators of this deck, uh, so that it was customary to speak of the tarot of the Bohemians or Egyptians. Okay, so now a lot of people link the tarot to Egypt. Um, obviously, he's calling it the Book of Toth, which is Toth of being an Egyptian god. Um, I think, just to make it brief and not too complicated, I think the confusion about the Egyptian origin of the tarot is the same, or essentially the same, as the confusion of the Egyptian origin of the gypsies, or the Roma people. But I think the tarot and the Roma are tied, and we do know today that the Roma have origins in uh, what's today northern India. They're, uh, they're, you know, they're related to, they're related to uh, the same people from that area from all kinds of, uh, <laughs> I'm just losing my thought. They're from India, essentially, but they migrated into Europe, you know, a long time ago. The tarot came with them. But they used to be confused for Egyptians for some reason. That's why they're called gypsies. And you know, Egypt has a lot of mystical, esoteric heritage. Obviously, ancient Egypt, and so 
modern occultists wanted to tie tarot into Egypt, but it's just not, it's not true. I lost my point and my place, and I just went off on a tangent. I sound like a dumbass. Okay, in the Middle Ages, these cards were used for fortune telling. Despite the etymology, were of Asiatic origin. Okay, so Crowley knows this, you know, as long ago as he was writing this, which is like, let me see if I can figure that out. I should have just translated it. You know, I read it in the beginning here. Okay. 44, I think, is the original. So I'm assuming he wrote most of this, these contents in 1944. Okay, so maybe that's really true. Okay, I went way too far. So. Egyptians, when it was found that the gypsies, despite the etymology, were of Asiatic origin, right? So Crowley knows that the gypsies are of Asiatic origin, or he means from India. Some people tried to find its source in Indian art and literature. There is here no need to enter into any discussion of these disputed points. I guess at the time they were more disputed. Unimportant to the present purpose are the tradition and authority. Einstein's theory of relativity does not rest on the fact that when we're here in the section, the theory of the correspondences of the term. Einstein's theory of relativity does not rest on the fact that when his theory was put to the test, it was confirmed. I'm just looking back at this note here. That's unimportant. We're on page four. The only theory of ultimate interest about the tarot is that it is that it is an admirable symbolic picture of the universe based on the data of the Holy Kabbalah. It will be proper later in this essay to describe the Holy Kabbalah somewhat fully and to discuss relevant details. The part of it which is here relevant is called gematria, a science in which the numerical value of a Hebrew word each letter being also a number, links that word with others of the same value, or a multiple thereof. And for example, Ahad. Yeah, that's um, so that's like anglicized Hebrew. That's A C H, or Ha Ha and D. Ahad or unity, or one plus eight plus four equals 13. Ahava, or love, is 1 plus 5 plus 2 plus 5, which equals 13. This fact is held to indicate the nature of unity is love. That's because what he's saying is both these words, unity and the love in Hebrew, equaled 13, or reduced down to 13, essentially. Then, IHVH, which is the name of God, or Jehovah, Yahweh, etc., Jehovah, etc., or 10 plus 5 plus 6 plus 5, which equals 26. It's uh, 2 times 13. Therefore, Jehovah is unity manifested in duality, and so forth. So you can get interpretations of phrases or words uh, by finding their numerical values and uh, trying to find them. One important interpretation of tarot is that it is a notarikon of the Hebrew Torah, the law. Also, the Torah or Roa, the gate. Now, by the Yetziratic attributions, see table at the end. This word may be read the universe, the new born sun, zero. This is the true magical doctrine of Thelema. Zero equals two. Zero equals two. Also by Gematria, the numerical value of Throa is 671. 
which is 61 times 11. Now, 61 is ein, nothing, or zero. And 11 is the number of magical expansion. In this way also, therefore, Droa, I think that's how we pronounce it, announces that same dogma, the only satisfactory philosophical explanation of the cosmos, its origin, mode, and object. A complete mystery surrounds the question of the origin of this system. Any theory which satisfies the facts demands assumptions which are completely absurd. To explain it all, one has to postulate in the obscure past a fan fantastic assembly of learned rabbins who solemnly calculated all sorts of combinations of letters and numbers and created the Hebrew language on this series of manipulations. This theory is plainly contrary not only to common sense, but to the facts of history and to all that we know about the formation of language. Nevertheless, the evidence is equally, equally strong that there is something, not a little of something, but a great deal of something, a something which is, which something which excludes all reasonable theories of coincidence in the correspondence between words and numbers. It is an undeniable fact that any given number is not merely one more than the previous number and one less than the subsequent number, but it but is an independent, individual idea, a thing in itself, a spiritual, moral, and intellectual substance, not only as much as, but a great deal more than any human being. Its merely mathematical relations are indeed the laws of its being, but they do not constitute the number any more than the chemical and physical laws of reaction in the human anatomy give a complete picture of a man. Wow. So that's pretty deep shit. Um, basically saying that uh, numbers uh, have an essence in themselves. They are essentially spirits in themselves. They are not merely just a thing that comes before another number or a thing that comes after another. They, uh, they have their own nature. Like gods, essentially, they're greater than humans. And, uh, they kind of are the essential foundations of the universe. Evidence for the initiated tradition of the tarot. Let's cut it there.